So he's board certified in ophthalmology. He's at the Wilton um, Surgery Center. He's a publisher of medical education and CME through Apollo Audiobooks. He's a coach in dietary and metabolic coaching, and he has the, com the uh, company essentially Cut the Killer Carbs International. And so, you know, there again, it's like, what the heck? I mean, he's an ophthalmologist, seriously. So, you know, it's like, you know, it's like me. I mean, with, you know, to cut is to cure or whatever. But it's just it's so exciting. fascinating and exciting to me to see, you know, physicians and um, all types of health uh, professionals really beginning to kind of, you know, focus on, on, a, on a more functional medicine, you know, let's not wait till you're sick and need 10 pills type of scenario. So um, Dr. Anderson will be speaking today um, and his topic is 21st century medicine back to the future. Did we get the meditation? Or? Well, that was a problem that was relatively easily fixed. So I'm Dr. Anderson. I'm an ophthalmologist here in town. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about modern medicine, modern morbidity, and modern diet. I kind of changed the title of the lecture as it progressed and as it evolved. And I would like to say thank you guys uh, for inviting me, and we'll talk about how this can hopefully improve your lives for some of you, and improve the lives of some of your patients. <coughs> and so I would like to start with a financial disclosure. Um, I started a little company, and it's a one-man corporation, but I, I gave it a big name, I called it Cut the Killer Carbs. And the corporation's purpose is to turn the tide on the twin epidemics of obesity and diabetes that we have in West Texas today. And if you've been around patients, you know that these are epidemics. If you want to learn about the website, I mean the program or what I do, it's at that website, metaboliccoaching.net. This is what I do on Fridays in my spare time. You know, this is my relaxation activity. And uh, Monday through Thursday, I'm a regular ophthalmologist, and I take out the cataract uh, in patients kind of 65 to 85 years old. We'll talk about the objectives briefly, and I'll read them. To appreciate the current epidemics of type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome and overweight and obesity in the United States today, recognize the features and health impact of the metabolic syndrome in particular and to understand the role that refined carbohydrates in our diet play in the etiology and management of these conditions. Also to recognize some other disease entities that can be amenable to diet therapy and to understand the basics of a dietary strategy or a nutritional strategy, which actually addresses the root cause. It addresses the causal factors for these disease processes. And so the whole reason I got involved in diet is there's me, about four years ago, there's my son, he's one, and I was 213 pounds, well 213 and a half, because when you subtract how much weight you've lost, it's, it's good to have an extra half on there. <laughs> <laughs> my blood pressure was 142 over 88, I was chronically fatigued, chronically exhausted, I felt horrible, and the way I would describe it is I felt hungover every day. And I got tired of feeling hung, hung over every day. And my wife started kicking me out of bed at night because I was snoring so loudly she couldn't sleep. And I knew from my medical training that I had gotten too fat. That's why I was snoring, that's why I didn't feel well. And I also remembered something else from medical school, which is that the body can be fueled either by carbohydrates or fueled by fat. And when the body's fueled by fat, you burn off your own fat in the process. And I remember when I was in medical school, they taught that in biochemistry or physiology, I thought, Oh, well, that kind of explains the Atkins diet, but you know, Atkins diet, that guy crazy, I thought at the time. And so basically what I did at this point when my wife was kicking me out of bed, I said, I'm done. I'm done eating the refined carbohydrates, eating the grains and the sugars. I'm cutting the carbohydrates out of the diet. And um, I, I lost weight, and I lost weight pretty quickly. And I went down to 169.2. Here I am, this is about three years later, and that's my daughter when she's one year old. My blood pressure normalized, my weight normalized, I lost 40 pounds. And the reason I include my HDL and triglycerides is that both of those are components of the metabolic syndrome. 
normal HDL is somewhere between, I think it's like 40 and 70. Mine's 76, which is higher than normal. That's what you want your HDL to be. Normal triglycerides are like 50 to 150. Mine is 48, they're super low. That's where you want your triglycerides to be. For me, not long after I had lost the weight, it was about a year after I lost the weight, I was feeling good, I went to a coffee shop. And at the coffee shop, I met, come on, I met a bariatric surgeon, a new bariatric surgeon here in town. And I, I said, oh, where are you from? And he told me, I said, what brought you to Lubbock? And he said, it's the second fattest city in Texas. And I thought that was really sad news. And I had just lost the weight, and I thought, it's not, it wasn't that hard. It doesn't have to be that way. With some education and some information, people can change their diet and change their life. And what's happening in West Texas is the same thing that's happening all over the United States. These twin epidemics of diabetes and obesity. They go hand in hand and they parallel each other. It only work if you do it like that? Yeah. <laughs> if, if we look at the, uh, the prevalence of obesity in the United States from 1960 to the present, it's gone from less, less than 15% of Americans were obese, meaning a BMI greater than 30, to more than one-third of Americans are obese. And there's another one-third of Americans that are overweight, which only leaves a third left that are normal weight. And at the same time that there's been the increasing rates of, or increasing weight of Americans, the obesity epidemic just kind of tracks right alongside it. As we're getting heavier, we're getting more diabetic. So we've gone from a society in 1960 where the majority of us look like this to a society today where two thirds of Americans. <laughs> Two-thirds of Americans and two-thirds of us in West Texas look more like this. And so the question is, uh, number one, you know, what causes? What causes us to develop overweight and obesity? And number two, what can we do about it so that as a society, we can look more like this again? And in order to answer that question, we have to look at a condition called the metabolic syndrome. And the metabolic syndrome is diagnosed in patients who have three of the following. Abdominal obesity, and you saw in the picture, I had it. High blood, uh, high blood glucose, high blood pressure, low HDL cholesterol, and high triglycerides. All of these go together, they're a, a syndrome. According to one study in 2010, approximately 36% of Americans have the metabolic syndrome. But those are only people who are untreated. Uh, when they did their calculations, they didn't include people who have treated high blood pressure, medically treated, pharmacologically treated high blood pressure. They didn't include people who, uh, whose HDL or LDL may have been pharmacologically treated. And in that same study, 56% of Americans uh, have abdominal obesity. So the true number of people that have metabolic syndrome is somewhere between 36 to 56 percent. <laughs> and you might ask, well, what's the big deal? You know, we're a little overweight, blood pressure is a little high. The big deal is that metabolic syndrome increases your risk for type 2 diabetes five times, cardiovascular disease three times, and the metabolic syndrome increases your risk for cancers of the breast pancreas, colon, and liver. And each of the individual components that make up the metabolic syndrome increases your risk for a particular cancer. So the fat is not harmless. So we've gone from a society that looked like this to this. Two thirds of us are overweight or obese. Somewhere between 36 to 56% have the metabolic syndrome, which increases our risk for a whole host of diseases. And so what can we do so that we can, as a society, go from looking like this back to like we did in the 1960s? 
And in order to do that, we have to look and see what is the root cause. Answer this question, what is the root cause of the metabolic syndrome? You gotta skip, you gotta skip right to the chase, right? <laughs> insulin, chronically elevated insulin, causes a condition called insulin resistance. That leads to chronically high blood sugars and diabetes. That's how, that's how diabetes happens. At the same time, insulin is a fat storage hormone in the body. And so insulin leads to obesity. And so insulin, oh and also insulin causes high blood pressure by sodium and volume retention, magnesium loss, and with magnesium loss, the blood vessels can't relax, and by stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. And those three things lead to high blood pressure. So we might think, aha, we've got the cause. You know, the cause of metabolic syndrome is insulin, chronically elevated insulin. But the question is, what elevates the insulin? And somebody said earlier, diet. Lots of people said diet. And there's specifically something in the diet that elevates our insulin level. Carbs. The dietary carbohydrates. Yeah. And I'm gonna set out a kind of step-by-step -step process how this whole thing happens and kind of leads to the insulin cascade of disease, as I call it. But the first step is that when we consume dietary carbohydrates, our body immediately turns those carbohydrates into glucose. Glucose is blood sugar. And in this study, they administered pure glucose, which raised the blood, uh, the blood sugar about 140 points. But look at these foods that cause a spike in your glucose. Potato, oatmeal, bread, rice. I'm not gonna say much about the lentils because lentils, you know, lentils and kidney beans, they don't raise the blood glucose very much. So that's step one, and then step two, Step two, the glucose increases our insulin. And we know this from the diabetics. The problem with type one diabetics is their sugar goes up and up and up until they end up in a coma. But for most healthy adults, our insulin brings the glucose levels down. And look at these same foods, what they do to your insulin levels. Oatmeal is the worst. Followed by bread, potato, pure glucose. That means the administration of, that means eating, Pure glucose raises their blood sugar less than potato bread and oatmeal. Wow. Is that interesting? And then rice is down here, and then beans are on the bottom again. <laughs> and then the third step um, is actually the insulin that stimulates fat growth. Uh, and we know this for two reasons. Number one, if we take a diabetic patient and we put them on insulin injections, they gain weight. And the weight they gain is not muscle. It is not bone. The weight they gain is fat. And that's from the administration of insulin. And number two, if a patient chronically administers insulin to the same site in the body over years and years and years, uh, it causes local fat growth, local fatty tumors. That's why they tell people to administer insulin in the abdomen and to spread it around, because then it'll look like normal fat. <laughs> that's true. Isn't that interesting? This is a, a picture from a textbook. This is a lady, a type 1 diabetic, who chronically administered insulin to the same two spots in her thighs for over 20 years. And so she developed these enormous tumors. These are cantaloupe-sized tumors, and you know what they are? They're fat. That is from the local stimulus of insulin causing the growth of fat. And so if you have chronically elevated insulin systemically throughout your bloodstream, you're growing fat throughout your entire body. That same process. <laughs> and then the fourth step is that, so this is what we just talked about. Insulin allows glucose to enter into the fat cell and be turned into triglycerides. And as long as insulin is present, none of the fat can get out. So insulin prohibits weight loss. And when we talk about weight loss, what we're actually saying is fat loss, because we, when we want to lose weight, we want to lose fat. And it's the insulin that inhibits fat loss. So step by step, the dietary carbohydrates raise the sugar, the increased blood sugar raises insulin levels, and the insulin stimulates the fat growth. And as if that wasn't bad enough, as long as the <laughs> insulin levels are present, insulin is high, it inhibits fat loss. And that's why people struggle to lose weight on high carbohydrate, low fat diets. 
And so what I'm proposing here is, well, let me start with this. In medical school, we were taught that patients were overweight. And their, them being overweight led to their problems with diabetes and high blood pressure and their increased risk for cancer. And that if we could just get patients to lose weight, they could lower the risk for those diseases. But I'm proposing a slightly different model here, which is that obesity is just another one of the symptoms of elevated insulin. It's elevated insulin, chronically elevated that leads to insulin resistance and diabetes. Elevated insulin directly causes high blood pressure. Insulin is a growth hormone. And talking about cancer, they're actually treating cancers, some cancers at MD Anderson with metformin. Metformin's a diabetes pill. You know, so, and if we get to the root cause, the root cause is the refined carbohydrates that we eat in our diet. It's the refined carbohydrates and the sugars and the grains that elevate the insulin and lead to this whole cascade of disease. So, if we could do a single intervention, the, in my mind, the one most powerful single intervention that would have the biggest health impact on our lives and our patients' lives, it would be to cut the refined carbohydrates and sugars out of the diet. Because what that does is that decreases the chronically elevated insulin, and then all of a sudden, boom. Without the elevated insulin, people can get off the diabetes pill. Without the elevated insulin, people's blood pressure gets better and they get off their blood pressure pills. Without the elevated insulin, they lose weight. Heart disease risk goes down. Theoretically, cancer risk goes down, but I don't know that that's ever been proven in a very large study. Um, so if we're gonna turn the tide on obesity and diabetes in West Texas, we need to get to the root cause of the problem. And we can't just medicate the symptoms. Because what we do so often, or what happens in a physician's office, is a patient walks in and they have diabetes and they get diabetes medication. And they also happen to have high blood pressure. So they get antihypertensives. And they also happen to be overweight. And there isn't really a good pill for that. You know? But they, we medicate all the symptoms and we give them pills to reduce the risk of heart disease instead of getting to the root. So if what we want to do is actually turn the tide on the obesity and diabetes epidemic in West Texas, we have to address the root cause. Address the diet, the dietary carbohydrates. And so you might ask, well, how do we lower insulin levels? How do we lower blood sugar, lower insulin levels? And it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you take a patient and he eats a typical, a typical lunch, this is a diet, I'm sorry, this is a, a tuna sandwich, a yogurt for a pudding, an apple, and a bounty bar. This is, and this is a normal person. This is not a diabetic. His blood sugar promptly doubles from 90 to 180. And what does his insulin level do? It's not showing in the graph, but his insulin level has to increase to bring his blood sugar down. And so you have the blood glucose spike, insulin spike, and then you go into the whole cascade of disease. And that happens three times a day, plus snacks, over and over, 365 days out of the year. However, if this same person eats a steak, lots of green leafy vegetables, and a Bernays sauce, look what happens to his blood sugar. Nothing. There's no blood sugar elevation. There's no, no insulin increase, it just stays normal. And it's, it's re really that simple to lower sugar and insulin levels. So I developed this program and I called it metabolic coaching. And metabolic coaching is designed to help people improve their weight, improve their blood pressure, improve their, improve their blood sugar, their diabetes, their overall health and their energy levels. And to do all of that through information, education, and practical application of that information. All, we, all I do is I sit down and I talk with people for an hour and a half. And the program doesn't sell diet pills or diet drinks or injections or expensive blood tests or diet shakes or nothing. It's just information. And we'll talk about the kind of information in the program. Because we know that table sugar is gonna raise our blood sugar. We know table sugar is not like a good choice, not a healthy choice. But there's this thing called the Harvard Glycemic Index. It's a glycemic index chart published by Harvard that shows how high certain foods raise our blood sugar. And actually how quickly they raise our blood sugar. And 
Pure glucose is the gold standard. It has a glycemic index of 100. It's the food against which all other foods are measured. And so it's time for pop quiz. Which one of these foods has the lowest glycemic index? Meaning, which one of these foods will raise our blood sugar the least? Banana. See, that, that's good because we, you know, we're like educated health professionals, right? So we should know that. Which one of these three remaining foods has the lowest glycemic index? Which will raise our blood sugar the least? The sugar. You guys are so smart. Did you get my slides beforehand? You're right, the sugar. It's the Snickers bar. And out of table sugar and whole wheat bread, which will raise your blood sugar the least? You're right. Table sugar. So, what we're talking about here is that we all know, and even, I mean, all of our patients know, they know that a banana is like a whole food, so it's probably a healthier choice. But what a lot of them think is that a lot of these patients who are diabetic, overweight, hypertensive, metabolic syndrome, they think that eating heart healthy, whole grain, whole wheat bread is good for them, but it's putting their blood sugar out of control. For me, I was never, I was never someone who was like addicted to sweets. Sweets weren't my thing. I didn't gain 40 pounds eating cakes and cookies and candy and sweets. It was bread, pasta, potatoes. And so, I, but I, if I was gonna eat bread, it's gonna be healthy bread. It was heart healthy whole grain bread. And the potato, I mean the pasta was like some whole grain pasta. But that's what, that's what made me fat were the breads and the refined carbohydrates. And so what we teach in metabolic coaching is just to cut the bottom off the food pyramid. Remove the refined carbohydrates, the breads and the starches out of the diet and stop that insulin blood sugar roller coaster. We all know that green leafy vegetables are healthy. And the glycemic index reflects that. Foods like artichokes, Brussels sprouts, lettuce, and mushrooms, they have a glycemic index of 10 to 15. They don't hardly budge the blood sugar. But look at this, this is white bread. White bread has a glycemic index of 71. Heart healthy whole grain wheat bread has a glycemic index of 71. No difference. There's some fiber in wheat bread, but it still has the same blood sugar and insulin effect on our bodies and our patients' bodies. Um, and talk about healthy breakfast choices. We'll start at the bottom. What about healthy special cake? You know, you know that's healthy for you because the commercial tells you it is, right? <laughs> and you're going to lose weight and it's healthy for you and it raises your blood sugar higher than table sugar. What about grape nuts? That sounds really healthy. Glycemic index 75, higher than table sugar. Instant oatmeal. This is a big one. Glycemic index of 83. I have diabetic, I have an aunt who's diabetic and diabetic patients, and they eat instant oatmeal every single morning because the oatmeal is gonna lower the cholesterol. They got, they got diabetes right now. And the worse their hemoglobin A1C is, the worse their blood sugar control is, the higher their heart disease risk. And look at this, a baked potato. Average glycemic index, 111. That's the highest, uh, there, there's probably foods that are higher, but that's the highest one that I ran across recently. So just to summarize, table sugar's glycemic index is 68, whole wheat bread 71, instant oatmeal, cornflakes, baked potato, they all raise our blood sugar higher than table sugar. And that's why I provide information, education, and application. Because people know sugar is not good for them, but they think they're doing themselves a favor by eating whole wheat bread, oatmeal, Things like baked potatoes. I had a patient who was a diabetic patient. He, he said he was feeling horrible. He had uh, lots of peripheral edema, lots of thinning edema. And he said, I eat a baked potato every single night. And I said, I, I looked at him and I know, that, I know that the carbohydrates are increasing his insulin level and they're causing him to have to hold on to more fluid. And I know it's not good for his blood sugar. I said, well, just 
you know, for a couple of weeks, I'll just be back in a couple of weeks. And this is in my ophthalmology surgical practice, right? <laughs> so for a couple of weeks, I said, just replace the potato with an extra piece of chicken at night, because he ate chicken and a baked potato every night. And he did it, when he came back, all of his edema was gone. So I mean, it didn't cure his diabetes, but that one kind of simple change could make a big difference in somebody's life. But it's not all about glycemic index. It's not just glycemic index. Because certain foods have their own individual problems. And first of all, wheat. Wheat contains gluten. And gluten is what makes pizza dough stretchy. It makes bread dough stretchy. And the gluten is made of gliadin proteins. And those gliadin proteins actually break down the intestinal lining, the gut lining, from your esophagus all the way down to your anus and cause a variety of GI problems. And in addition to that, uh, by breaking down the intestinal lining, it's pro-inflammatory and stimulates the immune system and can even be allergenic. There are all sorts of people walking around with seasonal allergies and asthma. It's due to wheat exposure. It's due to their diet. The only way they know is you cut it out for six weeks and see what happens. And if you cut it out for six weeks, amazingly, you no longer have seasonal allergies. I'm not saying that every single human being seasonal allergies is due to wheat, but I'm saying there's a significant proportion of people that suffer from this. <coughs> the way that uh, wheat is inflammatory is because these gluten peptides break down these tight junctions called zonula excluded in between the intestinal barrier, and that stimulates the immune system. And so the immune system then attacks the, the gut lining, and this causes uh, gastritis and ulcer gastritis, um, along with irritable bowel syndrome and all the commercials for irritable bowel syndrome that are out there, take this pill. I don't even know if there would be commercials anymore if there weren't pills, right? <laughs> sugar also is a special case because any kind of sugar, whether it's high fructose corn syrup or table sugar or maple syrup or honey, it's made up of two molecules, they're glucose and fructose. Glucose is the same thing as blood glucose. It's the same thing as blood sugar. And the glucose part raises our insulin, which tells our body to store fat. But the second molecule, fructose, your body can't burn that immediately. It has to convert it to a metabolite. And so the fructose is turned into triglycerides. And triglycerides are actual fat molecules. So this is what is technically and medically called a double whammy. Because the glucose tells your body store fat, and the fructose is fat. And that's why sugars are so fattening. Even though they have a lower glycemic index than some of those foods, they're still very fattening. So the modern American diet looks like this. About 15% of calories from protein, 20% from fat, and 65% carbohydrates. And that's basically what the food pyramid looks like. And my question to you is, does this look balanced? Or is it perhaps a little heavy on the carbohydrates? You know? I love common sense medicine. So what I'm proposing here is that we take a, you know, the food pyramid that looks like this, which is dominated by pasta and bread and bread and wheat and potatoes and rice and more bread. And every meal there's some sort of starch or bread. And instead move to a reasonable sort of food pyramid that looks like this where there's pl plenty of green leafy vegetables, healthy fats from avocado, coconut, olive oil, nuts, even butter. Butter's actually okay. It, it's, it's, so, <laughs> it's so funny the way you know modern medicine, modern medicine turns around and butter is okay. Yes. And lots of lots of healthy meats, eggs, and cheeses, some fruit, and very little sugar. They say never, when you're presenting to never hold this in your right hand because you point too much. So maybe I'll switch. But what we're into is we're into an era of modern medicine. And it's always modern medicine in eight minutes. From this study I read, it said, you know, that the average internist spends eight minutes with his patients from this particular study. And in that eight minutes, the patient presents with the diagnosis. Um, I mean, they present with their symptoms, they receive the diagnosis, they're written a prescription, and then the physician has to do all of the computer stuff. And there's there's all of, there's so much computer. But anyway, has to do all the computer stuff and review all the charts and everything, and then it's next patient, please, all in eight minutes. And so you're lucky if you get 90 seconds of nutritional information. And so the question is, 
<laughs> Who's addressing the root cause of the problem? You know, patients, they receive their medications for their diabetes and their blood pressure, but who's taking the time to really address the root cause? And that's why I set up this program, this metabolic coaching program, because instead of 90, and it's not a clinical practice. It's not my practice. I just sit down and do coaching. So I don't act, I'm not their physician. It's not, it's not in clinic with a doctor-patient relationship. It's a group of people, they come in and tell me what their health concerns are. And they say, I'm concerned about my weight, and diabetes, or I don't want to be a diabetic because my mom is, or high blood pressure, inflammation. And the list, it's all related because it's related by the metabolic syndrome. And so it's very easy to always give a very salient talk on their symptoms. But they tell me their symptoms and then we talk about it for 90 minutes. And after that, they move on and they watch a six hour online seminar. And the six hour online seminar goes more into depth about human metabolism and why some refined carbohydrates are, are uh, not good for you. And then there are written instructions and I even do some health and weight loss meditations. And the meditations, they're, they're like, they're guided meditations that work kind of like hypnosis, just to make the transition for people from that standard American diet, high carbohydrate diet, to a low carbohydrate diet, as easy and as painless as possible. And so now we'll go over some clinical cases. Um, the first case, this is a 34 year old male. He's a physician who's overweight with high blood pressure and chronically fatigued. Cut the refined carbs and sugars out of the diet and he lose, loses 40 pounds. Keeps that off long term with no, normalized blood pressure and weight measurements. You guys recognize that case? Yes. <laughs> and once again, I include, you know, weight uh, goes with abdominal obesity. It's one of the signs of metabolic syndrome. Blood, blood pressure, HDL, and triglycerides. I don't include LDL because LDL is not part of the metabolic syndrome. Oh, there's my son. The, so he's, he's three years old. I'll tell you the story. Anyway, we'll show him. He's so cute. So he's three years old, <laughs> and he, he develops allergies. And he's one of those kids who sneezes chronically for six months. And every time he sneezes, I don't know the medical term exactly, but the snot comes from his nose to his waist every time. It's just that. And so my wife says, well, this isn't normal. And I thought, well, you know, maybe he's just one of those kids. And she said, no, we need to make an appointment at the allergist. And so she made the allergist appointment, but of course the allergist is two and a half months away. And so while we're waiting, she reads a book called Wheat Belly. And in the book Wheat Belly, it says, some people are allergic to wheat or they have asthma due to wheat. And so my wife says, well, why don't we cut it out? And I said, they taught me in medical school that uh, right, uh, chronic allergic rhinitis and sinusitis that's due to allergen exposure from the air. It's not due to eating goldfish. <laughs> it didn't make any sense to me. But I said, sure, because I had already lost the weight. I already wasn't eating bread anyway, so it didn't, I didn't care. And when she did, it cleared up completely. He, he didn't sneeze snot down to his waist anymore <laughs> until we went to a birthday party. And he ate a chicken nugget that was breaded. And he sneezed for three days, the same kind of snot down to his waist and then it cleared up and then we went to another birthday party and we were like this is when we were new at this and we thought well we got to let him have cake because we don't want him to feel excluded and we let him eat the cake and the same thing happened again and this nice lady from down the street she brought us potato rolls she said this has no weed in them you can eat them and so we said well great and we ate them and the same thing happened again so i called her she said it wasn't whole wheat flour it was white flour <laughs> well, whether you use white flour or whole wheat flour, it still comes from wheat. So this is one of those things I would not have believed this if I had not seen it with my own eyes. And, and I've, I've since seen it in several kind of people. Next is the case of the guy who was my best friend in college, and, and he said, oh, well, you're the smartest guy I know, so I'm going to try this. <laughs> and so, and so he, he tried it, and the impressive thing about him running the fastest mile he'd run since high school is the guy ran state track. <clears throat> Next, a uh, 60-year-old female, she has type 2 diabetes, and her hemoglobin A1C had gotten out of control. Um, her hemoglobin A1C was 9.7, and actually her physician, she was on three oral diabetes medications, and her, her physician had prescribed her a fourth. And she didn't know what to do. 
And so she, she came and she talked to me and she said, I want to try the program and see if we can get my blood sugar under control. And she lost 30 pounds. Her hemoglobin A1C went from 9.7 to 7.4 in a three month period. That's, that's from, and so she went to go see her endocrinologist. And he said, well, I guess that fourth medication is really working. And she said, I've never got it filled. And she went from taking four, those, uh, from being prescribed a fourth medication, to now she takes metformin and half of one of her other prescriptions for uh, blood sugar. And her blood sugar is still good. But the surprising thing is she did it for, she did it for blood sugar control, but she has pseudo gout, which is calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. It's in, like an inflammatory arthritis where you get crystals in the joint. And she went from taking three pain pills a day for her gout, arthri her pseudo gout arthritis, to taking three pain pills a month. And that's the inflammation. That's breaking down the gut lining, stimulating the immune system, causing inflammation throughout the body. And this is Helena, and she works at my office. And if you wanna watch her story, she did a quick video just telling her story, and it's linked off the website. Now here's a 42-year-old female. She has Hashimoto's thyroiditis, lupus, and arthritis. These are all immune problems. She's not worried about her weight. But she cut the grains, and in addition to cutting the grains, so she cut wheat and corn, soy and dairy. So the, those, soy is actually very inflammatory for some people. By cutting those out, she had, went to her rheumatologist. She felt great. Her pain in her joints went away. She went to go see a rheumatologist, and the rheumatologist did, redid her blood test for Hashimoto's and lupus, and all of her antibodies were normal, just like a normal person. And so her rheumatologist said, tell me what you're doing. And he sits down with the paper and wrote down whatever her diet was. And this is Amy, and she works at my office. And you can look at her story on the website. And then uh, this is just a, you know, the regular overweight story. 37-year-old physician, a guy like me, we saw his, he saw his picture on Facebook, and a picture of himself at the beach on Facebook, and he thought, I don't look like that. <laughs> I'm not that fat. And then he just, he, he, he didn't even come in to see me. He just watched the program online, and did the program and lost 38 pounds. And this is Dr. Andy Bowman. He's a neonatologist. I went to medical school with him, and he works over at Covenant. So, quick pop quiz on some cases. <clears throat> How are we doing on time? I think we're good. We're good. <coughs> okay. 65 year old uh, female. This is going to be embarrassing. This is my mom. 65. I didn't get her permission to, to say it was her, but everyone <laughs> else I did. But she'll forgive me because she loves me. 65 year old female. She has overweight, chronic irritable bowel syndrome. She also has recurrent diarrhea, especially if she gets emotional. She has to run to the restroom. She has diverticulitis and diverticulosis and has been put on antibiotics multiple times. And so I told her over and over, why don't you just try six weeks, gluten-free, wheat-free, and see what happens. Try six weeks, gluten-free, and guess what happened? She called me two weeks into it, and she said, you know, every time I have a normal bowel movement, I think of you. <laughs> That's what every son wants to hear, right? <laughs> but the, the symptoms went away. It's quite obviously caused by the wheat and gluten in the diet. Now here's the interesting one. 32-year-old female with PCOS and infertility. That's polycystic ovarian syndrome. Do you guys know what the treatment is for polycystic ovarian syndrome? Metformin. Metformin. It's a diabetes pill. Guess what? This is an insulin resistance problem. So I talked to her, I said, well, why don't you reduce the carbohydrates, get on a low carbohydrate diet and see what happens. So the PCOS went away, she got pregnant, and I saw her at farmer's market last week, and she has her like five month old baby with her now. So, but you know, uh, patients, they, they have PCOS and they go to their doctor but, and sometimes the doctor just doesn't know. The doctor doesn't know that, that diet can be a really powerful strategy. I mean, think about this. Cure infertility by cutting the carbohydrates. I mean, that's ridiculous. A 30-year-old female, 
She's obese and has chronic knee pain. What do you think we should do? Cut the carbohydrates out of the diet. And the interesting thing with this lady is this lady's a runner. And she thought that her knee pain was because she was overweight. But when she cut the, the refined carbohydrates and the grains out of the diet, her knee pain went away before she lost the weight. That's because it's inflammatory. And so if she cheats, so she lost, she lost weight, knee pain's better, but if she cheats and say like has a sandwich or something, eats some bread, the knee pain comes back. It's, it's, it's so obvious to these people who they get relief and then if they say, well, I'm going out to dinner with a friend and so we're gonna eat whatever. And they end up, they just like, they say, forget it. I'm not eating the bread because I don't wanna feel like that. 35 year old female, chronic irritable bowel syndrome. She needs to cut the wheat and cut the gluten out of the diet. <laughs> Same thing, 45 year old female, obese with arthritis of the hands. Reduce the refined carbohydrates and grains, reduce the sugars, the, the weight comes down. And same thing, arthritis in the hands, it improves, and she said when she cheats and eats sugar, it hurts. Your body's trying to tell you something. Um, if you, you know, when you experience that pain, your body's trying to tell you don't do that to me. 40 year old male, this guy is actually a chiropractor. And he's overweight, he has arthritis in his hands. So he cuts the carbohydrates out of the diet and the arthritis in his hands went away. And he was very surprised. Because he said, I thought the arthritis in my hands was from all these years of doing adjustments on people. I didn't realize it was my diet that I eat every day that's making my joints hurt. It's not 15 years of adjustments. A 35 year old male, he has chronic recurrent uveitis. Uveitis is inflammation of the eye. He used to get about three attacks a year of his eye getting inflamed. You know what he did? He cut the wheat and gluten out of the diet. And now he has less than one attack a year. So I mean, he's not cured. It's not a cure, but it does improve, improve his condition by reducing his overall inflammation. A 40-year-old guy with gastritis and GERD, he's failing his proton pump inhibitor. Cut the wheat and gluten. That goes away. 60-year-old overweight hypertension. Same thing. Cut the, cut the carbohydrates. 65 year old overweight diabetes, cut the carbohydrates. What I'm not saying is this. I'm not saying that eating this way cures every disease that people have. And I'm not saying it's gonna cure cancer. But the, disease that, the diseases that the majority of us have, it's highly effective for those diseases. The diseases that affect two thirds of Americans. 47 year old knee arthritis, New onset high blood pressure, peripheral edema, and overweight. She cut the carbohydrates out of the diet and was able to get rid of her blood pressure pill. So her, she cut the carbohydrates out, her blood pressure went down, but then that was, that was her goal. Her goal wasn't to lose a lot of weight or whatever, and so then she just kind of kept her carbohydrates at a, a lower level. And finally, a 44-year-old female with obesity, and both of her two children are obese. And you see a lot of this, right? The great thing with her is that she cut the refined carbohydrates and the grains and sugars out of the diet. She lost weight. And she said, you know, really, I shouldn't be feeding my kids all this bread and these juice boxes and this macaroni and cheese. And now her, her son is normal weight. And her daughter is growing into her weight. The great thing with kids is when you cut the carbohydrates and the sugars out of the diet, they can, if they're still growing, they just grow right up into their weight. They don't even have to lose weight. So to summarize, diabetes and obesity are a twin epidemic, and the metabolic syndrome is the common link between the two. It's the carbohydrate that is the common causal factor. And by reducing that dietary carbohydrate, you strike at the root cause of all of those diseases, like high blood <coughs> pressure, high blood sugar, high insulin, overweight, and the metabolic syndrome and even things you would think are unrelated, like inflammation in other parts of the body. The glycemic index is a good tool to give you a good idea of which foods are gonna raise your blood sugar the most. And the refined carbohydrates and grains that are found at the base of the food pyramid, as well as the sugars, 
those are the foods that have the highest glycemic index. And those are the ones that we talk about reducing in the diet. So whether we're talking about improving the health of the modern oncology nurse, or we're talking about improving the health of our patients, and our neighbors, and our family, or about turning the tide on epidemics and obesity, using medication alone is not enough, because medication doesn't strike at the root cause of the problem. What we need and what our patients need is more information and education and to learn how to apply that, apply that information in their lives and to reduce all those grains and carbohydrates and starches that make up the base of the food pyramid. Um, I do new coaching sessions every week on Friday and then we have follow-up coaching sessions. And I'll just briefly tell you, so the follow-up from this week, I had four follow-ups from this week. One lady, she lost seven pounds in two weeks. And so I, that's the expected time of results and things. Another lady had lost 27 pounds over a period of several weeks, and that's expected. But uh, the third one, she was able to get off one of her high blood pressure medications. And that's a big deal, because we weren't really taught a lot in medical school about how to get people off their meds. We were taught when people had to have medications, but not how to get them off their meds. And the fourth lady, she was able to get off both of her blood pressure medications, two of them. So it's really, I mean, it's a powerful dietary intervention uh, for people. And I'll leave you with this quote from Sir William Osler, the father of the modern American medicine, who said one of the first duties of a physician is to educate the masses not to take medication. Thank you very much. sweeteners would be stevia and xylitol. Xylitol feeds good bacteria in your gut. And stevia, you know, as far as I know, I don't know if there's any problem with stevia. Um, other than that, artificial sweeteners, some, you know, there's some evidence that they're bad for you in one way or another. Um, but I don't have a real strong I don't have a real strong opinion on them. And the reason is this, because if, um, from a weight loss perspective, most people can tolerate artificial sweeteners and still lose weight. If I'm talking about improving their weight, their diabetes, their blood sugar, their blood pressure, they can still do it on artificial sweeteners, but some people can't. So if people get stuck, then we have to really look at the artificial sweetener. Does that make sense? Because like ideally, I would, you know, if you're talking about someone's ideal health, then I would say ideal health, you, everything would be organic, and your beef would be all grass-fed, and your milk products would be all from grass-fed cows, and you wouldn't use any artificial sweeteners. But then, there's real life, and people can't afford that, or they may not do it. So I'm trying to do the most good with the least harm, and so I don't, I don't, really rail against artificial sweeteners. But I will for a second. <laughs> I totally agree with what Dr. Anderson said. Um, stevia is a naturally occurring plant. Uh, xylitol, some of the other naturally occurring sugar alcohols, the resitol and all that, they're actually prebiotic. But there's actually a fair amount of data out now about the um, artificial sweeteners are actually function in, uh, as if they're neurotoxic number one. And then the other thing is they um, raise or uh, they're so intensely sweet that they actually have a central effect on the brain that causes you to crave sugar more. That's why there's a lot of studies out now showing that you're actually gaining weight if you're using, yes, if you're using the artificial sweeteners. So I, I, I couldn't agree more stick with a natural um, 
you know, the natural sweeteners like, or uh, zero calorie sweeteners like stevia and um, some of the sugar xylitol. Now, the sugar xylitol will sometimes give you a little diarrhea. And there, there are some studies that show that uh, the artificial sweeteners can raise insulin levels. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. and that's why, that's why people get stuck. Yeah. Because, They've got to go. Yeah. Because literally, it's so super sweet. Your brain says, holy crap, that was like a super sweet something, and it actually signals your pancreas. You gotta release some insulin because there is some, something coming. It, it's really kind of fascinating. That central media. That's yes, ma'am. Honey, if, it, if honey that is like grown, you know, naturally, harvested honey. People ask me about honey and maple syrup all the time. And the only problem with honey and maple syrup is that it's a combination of glucose and fructose. So there may be some beneficial things that maybe you could get them from beet. If you're looking for the beneficial parts of onion, then maybe you could take a bee pollen or something like that. But you don't need the sugar and the fruit, you don't need the glucose and the fructose, one of which tells your body to store fat and the other of which is turned directly into fat because that's not doing you any favors. It's sad. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, you had mentioned something earlier about dairy. Um, so, is dairy a product that you recommend to also weed out of the diet or not? So, based, you know, there are lots of dairy products which range from skim milk, which is zero fat, to butter or ghee, which is almost 100% fat, you know, with most of the protein gone. And so, if you're approaching diet from a, in, a blood sugar insulin perspective, the best foods to eat would be butter and ghee, hmm. followed by heavy cream, and then followed by, uh, um, wait, followed by cheeses, full fat cheeses, then things like heavy cream, and then you get into yogurts, because the bacteria that makes, the bacteria that makes yogurt and the bacteria that makes cheese eats the carbohydrate out. Okay. And so, and then you go down to whole milk, and the least healthy of which is skim milk. So we have actually, it's been 40 years of, we've been told to eat low fat for 40 years, and it's been a horrible failure. What do you think about corn? Corn? You know, the thing about corn is corn does not have as many of the inflammatory effects as wheat does. So it doesn't have those inflammatory effects. However, corn is a high glycemic food. A cup of wheat flour has about 92 net carbohydrates per cup. And a cup of corn flour, I think, has about 72. Now, the reason I said that the cupcakes or the muffins could be made out of almond flour is because the almond flour has nine net carbs per cup. So you can eat, you can eat pancakes, waffles, um, pancakes and waffles and cookies all day long made out of almond flour, sweetened with stevia, and not budge your blood sugar or your insulin levels one bit. What do you get almond flour? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are lots of places that have almond flour. Uh, the question was where to get almond flour. Actually, the place that's the least expensive and that they have the, the best quality for cooking is Costco. At Costco. The problem with almond flour is this. Oh, the, the problem with gluten-free foods is this. If you walk down the gluten-free aisle, um, they, they make those foods without wheat. They make them gluten-free, but they use the least expensive ingredients possible because they have to make a profit because they're in business. And so they're gonna use potato starch or rice starch. And those are the starches are they, the only, some of the only foods that raise your sugar higher than wheat does. So the glute, you, it would be good to be gluten-free, but don't eat gluten-free, as William Davis says in his book, Wheat Belly. Because, and that's why you won't find almond flour products down the, down the gluten-free aisle. Because almond flour is relatively expensive because it's made of nuts. And so there's no profit margin there. There's no room for a corporation to make profit. So for those things, you have to either make them yourself or if you go to the farmer's market on Saturday morning, there's a lady there who sells some almond flour stuff. So. 
And she took my course in 2013. What are some alternative things to feed your children if all they want is macaroni or something that's loaded with bread? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you this. I have a Facebook page, and so I have the web, the website, the Facebook page, and the YouTube channel. And on the Facebook page, I publish like every, almost every single thing I eat every single day, because people always ask that question. And so today, what did my kids eat for breakfast? We went, we went to the farmers market because I work there. I work at the farm. I'm interested in food. So I worked down at the farmer's market. We went down there and the kids, they, uh, they shared an almond flour waffle that the lady had made. Her name is Monty Cook. And then um, for snacks, lots of times they'll have yogurt, always full fat yogurt. If you don't ever buy any kind of flavored yogurt. Because what happens is this, if, if and notice full fat yogurt is better than 0% fat yogurt. You want full fat. They'll take a, if, if you get raspberry flavored yogurt, it'll have an extra 10 net carbohydrates in it. But if you look at a package of raspberries and you added the whole package, it would only be two net carbohydrates. So the way that they add raspberry flavor to something is by some concentrate or some sort of juice. So add the berries yourself. And that's what my, my kids would eat yogurt. They eat a lot of berries. Uh, at lunch, we had, uh, we had salami and cheese melt. And we just put salami cheese, put it in the oven. They had that along with uh, sliced apple. So we make sandwiches. There's just no bread. We make cheeseburgers all the time. There's just no bun. If we go out as a family of four, as a family of four, um, we, we all order cheeseburgers, no bun. And we may split one small order of fries. Although, I recently looked at the fries, and if you split an order of fries, each person would get like 15 net carbs, and so it's not, the potatoes are just amazingly, uh, amazingly high on starch and, and carbohydrates and glycemic index. Okay. Thank you.